For this video, we're going to do an example, and this will be a problem from velocity and displacement work energy method. Notice in the problem statement, we will have objects that change velocity and forces that happen to a displacement. So there's no information about times taking place, and there's more going on than just forces and accelerations here. We're going to be looking at velocity changes and energy changes in the system. This is also going to be an example with multiple objects in the system. So we're going to have kind of a gear that has some kind of a rotational motion going on. We are also going to have an object that is falling and pulling that gear. So two different objects go, that are both have different types of energy. So the gear obviously is going to have some rotational energy. It's pinned in place, so it doesn't have any translational energy. The falling object, it's not rotating, but it does have a one half mv squared. It has some translational energy. So this will be a really good example to explore both of those types of energies and also both of the types of work that would change those energies as well. Okay, so we're gonna be applying work and energy to the system. And we can also think about how to divide this up. So the starting energy of it, what changes it, and the ending energy of it. When thinking about how to divide this up, so what we can do is we can think about each piece individually, or we can think about each piece together. If we look at each piece individually, so we just have one piece and it's just moving and we look at the starting energy of it, and then we look at the ending energy of it and what changes it, right? And we write, we write our energy balance equation for it. And these are just some random numbers in a, as an example. But let's say that we have some starting energy, some work that changes it, and then we have some ending energy at the very end. Okay, so that was what's going on for this object. And we'll have to worry about the tension because that's part of the force that acts through a distance. And we'll have to worry about mg because that's a force that acts through a distance. And we won't have to worry about, okay, so we have this object. Then we go back to the next object and we just think about the gear, right? So the gear has some initial rotational energy and then there's a moment applied to it, right? So the, t the tension is tugging at it and maybe there's some friction that's fighting against it. So there's some kind of a moment that is changing how fast this thing is rotating. And then for just the gear, we have the final rotational energy. So maybe it starts going slow and then faster and faster and faster or something. And that rotation is changing because of the various moments that are applied to it. So we look at just the gear and figure out everything for the gear. And maybe we have some kind of an equation with, you know, the starting one half I omega squared and then the moment d theta. And then at the very end, we have some ending I, so some equation, right, for this thing. Okay, what happens if we draw our system boundary to contain both of these objects. In other words, tension is going to turn into an internal force if I put both of these together. And this one, this is why I put these numbers in here. Okay, so I have an equation for one, I have an equation for another. If I add those two together, three plus five, plus seven minus five, three plus five plus seven minus five, right? So I, I put everything together on one side. I'm treating the entire system together. And then the other side, two plus six plus one plus one, two plus six plus one, right? So I've got everything added together on the other side too. The fives, I purposely did this, it would cancel out. So that would be like the tensions. One is pulling up, one is pulling down. And so internally they would cancel out if you're looking at the entire system as a whole. But when you write this big equation for a bunch of objects that are all moving, and you can do this, and a lot of times it's a much better way to approach it because you don't have to worry about all those internal forces, but you do have to make sure that everything from each piece of it is still added together. And at the end of it, you have the energy from each piece of it all added together. Okay, so here's the example problem. We'll put some numbers to this thing and actually crank through it. We have a drum and a flywheel. They give us the inertia, that bar over the top. This means the inertia around the center of mass, which it's pinned at the center of mass. It's rotating around it, so that simplifies that piece of it. Okay, so here's the inertia around the center of mass. 
and we have the, the weight is pulling it down. So if you think about which way the weight, it, that's going counterclockwise, and there's going to be a moment from friction that is trying to stop it from rotating. So there's actually two different moments going on here. The weight pulling it one way, and friction is going to be fighting against that, pulling it the other way. They give us some starting conditions. At the instant shown, we're going at six feet per second. And we want to know the new velocity after it's moved four feet down. So this is what really tells you we're doing an energy work problem. We have a starting ener starting velocity, which is a starting energy, starting velocity forces through a displacement four feet down, and then we want an ending velocity. So whether without telling you which section of the book this problem happened to come out of, if you read this problem statement, your mind should immediately come <clears throat> to an energy balance equation because we have starting velocity, we have forces acting through some distance, the block is going to be falling four feet downward through a distance, we have moments acting through this period, and then we have to figure out what the final velocity and energy of the system is. So let's plug in some numbers here. We're going to need to use some kinematics. So um, the velocity at the edge of this drum is going to be the same as the velocity of the center of this mass, right? So this string has the same velocity all along the whole edge of it. So V is equal to R omega. We can get the rotational angular acceleration of the drum by the velocity of this block falling. Um, so let's go ahead and plug some numbers in. We know the velocity. That means we know the angular velocity. It's a good idea when you're writing your equations to include the units on everything. Make sure that everything's in feet or everything's in inches. You're getting radians out of it. Seconds instead of minutes or hour. Usually just keep everything in seconds is, is good. So here's We've got velocity, and instead of having two unknowns, velocity and omega, now we have our omega information, too, for everything. Start with the starting energy. So we have both translational energy of the block falling and rotational energy of the flywheel. So here's the block falling, 1 half mv1 squared. This is mass, not weight. So make sure you're not just plugging in 240 pounds, right? We have to turn that weight into a mass here. So divide by 32.2. This is good to keep everything in feet and seconds if you're using 32.2. So we have our mass here, and then we also have our starting velocity. That's what was given to us in the problem statement. So six feet per second, that is the velocity of this block falling down. So there we have the energy of one piece of it, but that's not the only thing moving. And we defined our system boundary as both of these together. So now we're gonna go on to the flywheel and figure out the starting energy of the flywheel. So it's rotating. We're gonna use one half I omega squared instead of one half MV squared. We were given in the problem statement what our inertia was. So we can plug that inertia in, and we can also figure out what our omega is through some kinematic relationships. Okay, so we have our starting omega for this. So between this velocity to omega relationship and everything that was given in the problem statement, we can calculate what our starting energy was. So there is one piece and just go through this equation one piece at a time. So there's our T1. Okay, final energy. And we don't yet know what velocity it's gonna come to, but we'll just leave that as a variable rather than plugging a number into it. So the final energy is gonna be something similar where we have the block is moving. So we'll have a 1 half mv squared, and this is the mass of the block and the velocity of that block 
And that was, that was given in the problem statement too, the, the weight of the block. And we'll have one half I omega squared for how fast this um, flywheel is rotating. It's gonna be a different rotational rate at the end than it was at the beginning. So using the same inertia that we had before, only now it's gonna be a different angular velocity. And angular velocity is V over R. So we can use this kinematic relationship in here to figure out our I omega squared. Okay, so we have the starting energy. We have an equation for the ending energy. We still don't know what the velocity is. That's kind of the point of the whole thing. The one thing in this equation that we have left is to figure out the work that changes this. And there's two pieces to this. We're gonna have force through a distance and moments, all of the moments applied to this through the angle. Okay, so here's T1, T2. Remember the displacement is gonna be, okay, so for work, FDS. So we have a, a displacement in distance, which is it moves four feet down. But then we also have to figure out the radians change. So a moment is not acting through a distance, it's acting through some rotation. So how many radians has this happened in? For the, for the edge of this, if the block has moved down a little bit, then that means it's rotated through theta degrees. So this is like circumference equals two pi r, or if you do the two pi, that equals circumference over r or arc length over r. So distance divided by r is the radians that this thing has rotated. So that's another little conversion to do. And here is the two parts to our work. So we have force through a distance, okay? So that's the weight. So we're not doing mass anymore. This is mg. So we have the entire 240 pound weight and that happens through four feet. So this, you can think of it in terms of work, force through a distance, or you can think of that in terms of potential energy. This is like an MGH that's happening here. So either way, it works out the same for these equations. And the next part of it is the applied moment. And for this one, internal forces cancel out. So the tension pulling up versus the tension pulling down we don't have to worry about that, which is pretty nice. Solving for the tension, that would be one more equation, a few more hassles, but defining both of these in the same system boundary, the only moment we're gonna have to worry about here is friction. So if you have heat given off of the system or like gravity, that crosses system boundaries. So that would be an external force. So the force, the friction force, 60 foot pounds, and pay attention to the sign. So is friction making the energy larger or is friction making the energy smaller? And again, energy is not a vector. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative or up or down, what direction it is. It's the magnitude, how the magnitude is changing. So if it's a scalar property, it's not a vector. Energy is not a vector. You, you get these signs not based on direction, you get these signs based on what it's doing to the magnitude of the energy. So in this case, friction is slowing it down. It's making the energy smaller. So we're gonna subtract off that moment and multiply it by this distance that it's traveled through the system. Okay, so two pieces to that work. We have the block moving around and we have this guy rotating, the drum rotating. And at the very end, we're going to add together everything that we found. So we have the starting energy, 255. We have the work that's going into it. The weight wins over the moment. It wouldn't move at all, right? If friction was large enough, it wouldn't move at all. So it's, it's still speeding up, but it's not going quite as fast as it would if it was just you know in free fall or something, right? So we have the starting energy and the work 
that weight is winning, so it's going in a positive direction and it's speeding it up. And then we have our final energy. And that's our only unknown is V2. So we can go ahead and solve for the final velocity of the block. And you could back calculate how fast the drum is rotating to from that, or V equals R omega. Okay, so hopefully that was a good example that shows you how to handle multiple objects and translational motion as well as rotational motion. Here is what that problem would look like in Mathematica. I, I really do encourage you to use some kind of software, whether it's MATLAB, Octave, Mathematica, Maple, whatever you're familiar with, because it's a lot easier to um, change things around. Maybe you had a unit error or a sign error. It's just solving these things, it's like debugging a computer program. There's always going to be one little piece that you punch in just slightly wrong, and it's it's a lot easier to debug it if you have it in some kind of a program that you change one thing. And for Mathematica, you hit shift enter and it evaluates it. So here's our starting energy, T1, our work going through it, our ending energy, T2. And once we have all of these guys assigned, T1 plus U and 2 equals T2. It's a comparison operator here, two equal signs. And I'm solving for my final velocity. And boom, there, there you go. And then I can modify this really easy too. So I can maybe change the mass and see how much that speeds up the velocity or change the height or something. So yeah, it's, it's a lot nicer to use some kind of a, a program on that.